Hey, I'm Connor Warner here with the Straight From a Scientist podcast. This is episode 56 with Rachel Cherney of the Calabrese Lab right here at UNC. And I talked to her about long non-coding RNAs, that's link RNAs. So we used to think that the DNA base pairs dictated function, right? We used to think that the blueprints that were in DNA basically said what you were going to be made of and what you would turn into if you were an organism or from a cell, right? That's not the case. So these link RNAs could be this kind of black box. This It's almost like dark matter in physics research um, where scientists are just starting to understand that they have this huge effect, but we don't necessarily know all their effects yet. Rachel dives into uh, how she's going about the, the issue and um, really they're kind of they're starting at one place and, and we're going to move outwards from there. So it's this, this burgeoning field that people are just, just tapping the surface of. And it could explain why we are so different, for example, uh, from bananas or plants who have even more genetic code than us raw, but, uh, and, and yet we're, we're just so complex. So uh, yeah, it was an awesome discussion. Uh, Rachel is also a part of SWAC, Science Writing and Communication Club. There's going to be a link for that. Um, in the network page as well as the show notes of this and I highly recommend if you're looking to get a scientist perspective in written form uh, they're the best place to start so they run a blog it's called a pipette pen here from grad students at UNC and everyone's writing about their you know, not necessarily research topic but something they really really know deeply and they also put it in layman's terms so you can understand it from the base perspective and then go even deeper into your reading so uh, really really love that that blog and uh, of course uh, Rachel's doing great work with that so I'll, I'll let it over to the podcast again you can find us on iTunes Spotify Stitcher YouTube uh, please leave a review comment like all of that really helps support us um, and you can check us out on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter actually we're on those too so <laughs> enjoy all Welcome everyone, Straight From A Scientist podcast here. I'm Connor Wander here with Rachel Cherney of the Calabrese Lab. Um, actually, fun fact, she's Jenna Beam's roommate. So you might remember Jenna from episode 53. Um, go check it out if you haven't, it was a great one. Thanks Rachel for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> did, uh, did Jenna clue you in on <laughs> what's gonna happen here? She did, I was a little nervous, but really excited that you reached out to me. Yeah, I'm really excited too. Um, you know, I've, I've heard about your lab's research for a while. And we're gonna unpack it. It's the title, I guess, would be like link RNAs in genetic regulation. Is that yeah, fair? Yeah, gene regulation. Okay, so we're gonna unpack that again. We're gonna have a crash course in genetics. But I also want to mention that you're president and treasurer of the Science Writing and Communication Club here at yep. UNC. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a that's gotta be a lot of work. I appreciate what you're doing. Yeah, <laughs> I no know. problem. I really enjoy it. I've been, um, you know, I've written for SWAC just once actually. But uh, every every experience I've had is great, and you, you guys write really great articles. So I read your one, um, kind of a cursory read on how genetics between organisms are just so vastly different, and yeah, that's really what you're getting at with your research, right? Yeah, it's a really fascinating topic, especially since the history the history of the field of genetics. Um, the organisms or like animals that seemed to be more complex would have more DNA or more genes and we're just finding out that that's not true mm -hmm. so we're trying to see what makes an organism complex air quotes um, complex <laughs> uh, or not um, from my article that you read um, plants actually have more certain plants have more mm -hmm. DNA more genes than humans do so why yeah <laughs> and all that's just really fascinating I think it was the banana has more than we do, right? Yeah, the ban In banana of... or rice is one that okay, has yeah. way more DNA. In... So a simple plant like rice, or seemingly simple grass like rice, has way more raw genes than a human does. Um, now, I think we need to kind of step back a little bit and talk about DNA, genetics, um, for those who really don't know, and myself included, I'm not, definitely not an expert. So uh, people have probably heard of DNA, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry, um, deoxyribonucleic acid. Yep. 
that's on our chromosomes that's like the would you say like the raw information yeah so you can think of dna as your blueprint it's what makes you you and dna gets packaged into our into our cells um and the packaged dna is a chromosome okay and then there's rna after that yes so stage one would be dna yes stage two is rna yes ribonucleic acid that's the message that gets sent yeah so someone reads off the blueprint sends it out to the factory is that kind of pretty a... much yeah so it, it's the central dogma of biology is that dna our blueprint becomes rna mm -hmm. which is like an intermediate messenger and then this rna ultimately becomes protein so the characteristic um, functional units in our cells mm -hmm. so proteins can be like what makes up your hair and your skin it can be the antibodies in your body that fight disease it can be what structurally holds your organs and everything together mm -hmm. um, so because of all of these important functions of protein it's been thought for a very long time that proteins carry out like all the functions mm -hmm. in a cell and it, DNA ultimately becomes protein. Okay. Spoiler alert, that is changing, right? And that's kind of what that you're looking is at. <laughs> changing. We are yeah. finding out that things are a lot more complicated uh, than we previously thought. Yeah. Um, that is my impression as well. And it's really, really scary. So if we could step back just a little bit and review DNA converted into RNA, that's the process of transcription people yes. might have heard of. Mm -hmm. um, and then from RNA, the translation, building like the protein widget or whatever it is, yep. um, these little molecular building blocks for all of us. Now, in between the DNA, the RNA, and then the actual protein, there's a lot of like slicing and dicing that happens yes. to the DNA strand, right? So uh, I've heard so that- not to the DNA strand. Oh, sorry. The to R the yeah, RNA strand, right. yep. And that's <laughs> what adds to the complexity um, of humans or the difference in genes between difference in number of genes between humans and say plants um, so a gene encodes some sort of product whether it helps produce hair color or it helps produce blood type um, and what we've realized is that you can have an like one rna from one gene can be cut or diced in multiple ways to produce different proteins and so this is called alternative splicing so you can the body chooses which parts of that mrna to keep and which ones to get rid of to create different products yeah look at that in my research as well they're called protein isoforms mm -hmm. um, in my case and so you have all these different versions at least in the case that i'm looking at tau and alzheimer's disease it's the same protein but the different versions have a dramatic effect on whether someone might get corticobasal degeneration versus, um, you know, another disease like Alzheimer's disease. And there's all these subgroups in there. So those little variations have a huge effect, as far as I know. But in the development of an organism, I mean, could they just change the game entirely? Is that the idea? Yeah, I don't know so much for development. Um, uh -huh. I do know if you look at the work in Humana Judice's lab. There is a spliced isoform, I think, in heart muscle um, that when you are in development, you have one isoform, and then upon reaching adulthood, it switches to another protein isoform. And then certain cardiac diseases, they're finding is that that protein uh, goes back to the fetal isoform. And so they're trying to figure out how that happens, how the fetal isoform is coming back in adult switches hearts and back in. causing disease. Huh. Yeah, it's troublesome. <laughs> but yeah, definitely. But um, this splicing explains why humans have about twenty thousand genes, but over a hundred thousand proteins in the body. So we're able to basically make a lot of different versions from the same code. That's highly efficient. I like that. Uh, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> um, is there any idea of why we? Not we we didn't design it, but why humans, maybe other mammals, have such efficient DNA to RNA structure versus plants just do whatever they want. Um, they they seem to have a ton more genes, and yet they're not that complex. 
Yeah, so it's definitely not just humans, it's also right. mammals, um, I guess higher order organisms. G or in plants, they also tend to have multiple copies of chromosomes. So in humans and mammals, um, we get one copy of our chromosomes from our mom and one from our dad. Mm. But plants don't necessarily have that. They can have two to three copies of each chromosome. And so because they're not, I mean, they're definitely complex in their own way, but they are a lot more resistant to mutation and variations uh, than humans and other mammals are. Mm. Hmm. That's pretty neat. I, I also wonder I, in this, you know, I know you're not a plant biologist, the whole life cycle of a seed sprouting, like there's a lot of different changes that happen in a plant's life cycle yes. that don't necessarily happen in mammals. I mean, you have kind of the building blocks of an embryo mm -hmm. and that's relatively the same throughout all vertebrates. Whereas I think some seed germination goes a bunch of different ways. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, now <laughs> that thought. you bring that up, I kind of want to go look into it. See. <laughs> but if you're a plant biologist listening to this, hit us up. We'll, <laughs> we'll ask you a bunch of questions. No, it's okay. Um, just kind of tangential. So that's pretty much all talking about the coding regions of, of RNA and that's DNA. Right. But you research something that's entirely different. So there's this huge area of the genetic code that doesn't actually directly make protein, yep. that's my understanding. Yep. So if you take the whole genome, all of your DNA, only about 1% to 2% of that becomes protein, functional protein mm. pieces. Um, the rest of it used to be called junk, junk DNA because people didn't know what it did. Mm. It, they just thought that it wasn't necessary. It was just left over from evolution. Um, but with um, high throughput sequencing, we're realizing that about at least 75% of our genome is transcribed is being turned into RNA. Hmm. And so if it's not becoming protein, what is it doing? And the assumption is, since that requires a lot of energy to turn it from DNA to RNA, it's gotta be doing something, mm -hmm. right? Otherwise, you know, evolution is fairly efficient. Um, you wouldn't wanna waste all that energy in your cell. That's a huge black box. Yes. <laughs> and I think, so, looking at these RNAs that get transcribed and don't become protein, we're trying to understand what their functions are. Mm. And they do interact with protein to carry out their functions. But, but you don't know how, we don't right? know how. And so that's part of what we're looking at. So I've heard link RNAs can do a lot of different things and they're really, really hard to study. Yes, they're really it's... hard to study first off because we, it's very hard to identify them in DNA. When you look for protein coding genes, they have a very distinct structure. Mm -hmm. um, you have your five prime on translated region that kind of like starts the process of transcription. You have your uh, translation start site where the protein begins to be translated. You have the termination site. You have your exons and your introns. Your exons are the pieces of the mRNA that become protein and the introns mm -hmm. get cut out um, intron and extra, ex exon splicing is what leads to different protein isoforms. Um, but link RNAs don't have that distinct structure, mm. so they're very hard to find in the genome and annotate. And secondly, most link RNAs are not expressed as highly as protein coding genes are. So even if you look at um, RNA sequencing, it's hard to identify what is a link RNA ex being expressed or what is just noise in RNA sequencing. Hmm. That's scary. <laughs> it is. So there could be, you know, tens of thousands of link RNAs. Yeah. And so far as I know, not so many have been identified or yeah. studied. I do need to step back. I realize we didn't explain link RNAs, oh, like what yes. that abbreviation is for. Uh, so it stands for long non-coding RNA. So of all of the RNAs that do not become protein, mm -hmm. they're called non-coding. Right. Um, and then just a very general distinction is small non-coding RNAs are less than 200 base pairs. Long non-coding RNAs are anything greater than that. Mm -hmm. Do they have like very different functions, whether they're small or long, or is it just 
it, the way to study them is different? Like, what's the point of categorizing them, I guess, is the question? I don't know what the point of categorizing them okay. is. I think smaller non-coding RNAs are better studied because they include microRNAs mm. and um, transfer RNAs, I believe. Right. I, um, like snow RNAs, mm. all of these RNAs that I don't necessarily <laughs> know. I know what microRNAs are, but like snow I'll try RNAs. and put a visual in because these are really hard to imagine if you haven't seen them yeah. um, before. Now, I guess they're the small non-coding RNAs are definitely low-hanging fruit because they're smaller and you can make them a lot easier. You can sequence them a lot easier, especially with older sequencing techniques that like every base pair you got charged for. But mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the long non-coding RNAs, I think they're more numerous. Am I wrong on that? They So there are more annotated from the best that we can annotate genes. There are more okay. long non-coding RNA genes and small non-coding RNA genes of, yeah. that we know of. Um, but what does that mean if we can't really study all the functions of them yet yeah. with our techniques available? I mean, it's, yeah, it's this huge, like, gray area. I, I would almost, I guess, um, compare it to dark matter in space yeah. and, and, like, kind of um, astrophysics in that we know it's there now. We know it's doing something, mm -hmm. like, otherwise or all the calculations show that you know it, it does exist and it's there but there's so much of it and we haven't even started to break the surface is that yep. kind of where we yeah. are right now so there are a couple of there's one really well studied rna link rna um and we still don't even know how that works um and then there are a couple others that our lab focuses on mm -hmm. um but we have a computational student who is trying to understand how we can identify link RNAs in the mm -hmm. genome. Um, so going into the one link RNA that's extremely well studied, it's called EXIST, which stands for X inactive specific transcript, and it is involved in dosage compensation in all mammals, um, in all plac placental mammals. So if you are a female, you have two X chromosomes. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a male, you have one X chromosome. And because females have two times as many X chromosomes as males, one of those needs to be shut off mm -hmm. to equalize um, the numbers of chromosome. And so what EXIST does is this long non-coding RNA um, is transcribed is from DNA to RNA and just Something about its structure, something about its sequence brings in hundreds of proteins and shuts down this X chromosome. Mm. If this X chromosome isn't shut down, then it can lead to lethality in the embryo. Mm -hmm. um, if it's not, if it is, if exists is expressed, but something is not quite right, it can lead to developmental disorders. If certain X linked genes, uh, genes on the X chromosome are still active. So it's a very important biological process that yeah. we still don't understand. And because we don't understand exist, which in itself is probably an outlier of link RNAs in the fact that it silences an entire chromosome. There is a huge effect, yeah. Um, <laughs> compared to the other link RNAs that we know that silence or turn off genes rather um, in smaller regions, mm. exist may be an outlier and maybe what we're studying for that isn't going to be the same as other link RNAs. Mm -hmm. So it's, we have this one classic example that might not even be representative of others. And so we're just trying to you gotta figure start out somewhere. something. Yeah, you got to start somewhere, yeah. though, right? So when you're talking about dosage, it's gene dosage, it's, right? Yes, So it's, it's not gene like dosage. you would think of a drug. Um, but in the case of X chromosome inactivation, if you don't inactivate that, you get double the dose. It's like almost like a genetic overdose. Exactly. That's a cell. great way to think about it. Um, yeah, that seems pretty devastating and for example trisomy um down syndrome there's duplication of a chromosome and you get a, a lot of uh, amyloid precursor protein for example so a lot of things uh too much of one thing expressed in the brain can can cause a lot of damage so yeah i mean i think that's a good a good gene to start uh working or sorry not gene i shouldn't say um link rna to start working on especially if you have this whole host to work with you can look at something that has i guess like a measurable effect mm -hmm. in the cells that you know you have to start somewhere so and i know other people in the lab are working on 
ways in which you could learn from that one and then apply it and just have computers search the database yep. um, and you can start picking out other ones but i mean how many are we talking about do is it billions of link rnas i don't know what the order of magnitude is <laughs> i wouldn't say billions okay. maybe between tens and t between tens of thousands up to a hundred thousand would be like a very high right. high estimate um still a lot if you're going one by one yeah <laughs> yeah uh, but the way that we're looking at this is that proteins that interact with rna or even dna recognize specific motifs or rather um sequences of base pairs okay and exist especially um has certain domains that are very structured and have motif repeats whether it's like A T A A A or something. Um, so what our graduate student has been working on is identifying proteins that recognize that motif and seeing where else in the transcriptome, which is trans all transcribed RNAs, where this protein is likely to interact with. Mm. And from this list, he's pulling down all sorts of transcribed RNAs that you know, we don't know what they do. Sometimes they're introns of protein coding genes, which is really intriguing. Um, so that's kind of how we're starting to identify uh, how link RNAs may be functioning or interacting with proteins to regulate function. And they, like I said, there are you know hundreds of thousands of proteins, mm. or like a, about 100,000 um, in our cells. So there are so many that can be interacting with long non-coding RNAs to regulate function. Yeah. So there's all these layers that I'm thinking of. Um, yeah. And I definitely have to give a visual because having seen this, it's already complex when you're looking at it. Yeah, I can try to send you some stuff <laughs> That'd afterwards. That'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so you have, you have the RNA and then RNA binding proteins are brought to it by link RNAs, presumably, among other things. Yeah, so it could be the link RNA itself when it's transcribed mm -hmm. from the DNA locus is immediately interacting with RNA binding proteins. Okay, and then sends them to a certain spot or? So another layer of complexity, yeah. uh, link <laughs> RNAs fun have different functions too. Right. Some, um, when they're transcribed, from that DNA locus, this is something you definitely need a visual for, um, <laughs> but right at that locus on that one chromosome, um, they bring proteins to either shut down genes or carry out different functions, but they only function on the chromosome that they're transcribed from. So they don't affect any other chromosome mm -hmm. or any other area in the genome. But then there are other link RNAs that go to other places in the genome. Oh, so why yeah. how does that happen how does it know where it's supposed to go mm -hmm. um so our lab focuses on link rnas that are transcribed from one chromosome and stay on that chromosome mm. start simple and then work outward i think is a good strategy yes do you mind bringing that mic just a little closer like an inch or two that'd be fine i'm just worried it's not picking up you on the lower end um so this this seems to parallel epigenetics which yes. was like a buzzword, you know, a few years ago, and I haven't heard as much since then. And I'm wondering if the discovery of link RNAs and their existence has made people kind of rethink all of this epigenetic regulation. So um, for people who are, epigenetics is just the regulation of genes, and that can be very general. So link RNAs are definitely playing a part in that. Mm -hmm. uh, typically people thought it was these little smaller molecular tags on dna that yes. would kind of unwind it from the histones kind of like pulling a library book off the shelf but how do you how do you think about all of those other modifications we i don't really want to go too deep into those but how do you think about those interacting with link rnas or are we too early in both fields to start we're not too early so exists um the link rna that shuts down the x chromosome recruits epigenetic modifying complexes so these complexes that add epigenetic markers uh, to dna okay. and that's yeah. how the genes are silenced um so two really classic 
uh, epigenetic complexes, especially in X chromosome inactivation, are the polychrome repressive complexes one and two. Um, so somehow exist recruits these proteins, protein complexes to the X chromosome, and since they're near the X chromosome, they start shutting down genes. Hmm. Uh, very general, like there's a yeah. lot that goes on. <laughs> um, but the other two link RNAs that we study in our lab function similarly to exist in that they also recruit these polychrome repressive complexes to silence genes. Um, and they also function from the same chromosome hmm. that they're transcribed from. And so because of these characteristics, um, that they're all kind of similar, that's what we're studying to try to understand similarities and differences in identifying link RNAs. You have somewhere to start at least and you know like mechanistically what it should be doing when it's on the DNA. And from there you are do you, does the lab plan to branch out to other link RNAs like um kind of in your thesis project. I guess you can't tell us too specifically. I cannot. Right. Um uh, I'm trying to like yeah, I'm trying to Science is unfortunate in that you can't always speak openly because then another lab might listen in and like want to steal your stuff. Um, are you on the trail of anything right now that you can talk about generally that you're really excited about? Uh, if you had asked me like a month ago, yes, <laughs> before my thesis project kind of took a turn. Um, it always does. Yeah. Yes, it does. Um, my project is still exciting. It's I'm not on the same path that I was, but there are a lot of leads that we're following up on. Mm -hmm. um, as for whether we're going to look at other link RNAs, um, potentially, it depends on how my project pans out. Mm -hmm. I did um, RNA immunoprecipitation coupled with sequencing, mm -hmm. um, which looks at you identify a protein you know that you want to IP, see the RNA that's uh, bound to it and mm. then you sequence that RNA so where RNAs and proteins are interacting. Mm. So, so I did that with one of my proteins of interest and pulled down mallet one which is a link RNA that's very highly transcribed um, but its function isn't really well known. It seems to be involved in many different things and no one is very uh, there isn't really a clear answer of what it's doing, so mm. that may be something we'd follow up on in the future. It just depends on how experiments go. Mm -hmm. So you're doing a good amount of like lab bench work, yes. um, right? I know other people in the lab do computational stuff, and it's really neat to see that vertical integration yes. of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So um, immunoprecipitation, sorry. Uh, you basically, you find that two things bind, and then you kind of you spin them down, uh, I don't know how to, <laughs> you pull them out of the liquid that they're in, right? Yeah. Everything, we're, we're moving liquids around all the time That's in the lab. That's pretty much what yeah. science is, yeah. So Very we abstract. use a procedure called cross-linking, where you physically fix, you know, proteins mm -hmm. and RNA if they are interacting to each other, mm -hmm. so that when you're doing your experiment, you're moving liquids around, they stay connected okay. until the very end, and then you can separate them. So then you can look at either just the RNA or just the protein. Mm -hmm. So if they're already attached, you chemically glue them together yep. to reinforce that. Because in a normal cell, they'll attach and then they'll detach and, yes. and all that. So you have to like freeze that moment in time, then take them out, and then you can like look at them parts. They're so, so small, though. <laughs> that, that's got to be really tough. And uh, I know uh, the non-scientists may not understand like how frustrating it can be sometimes, but um, it's all worth it, right? Yeah, I mean, I love it. It's exciting. <laughs> how has, like, I, I love to ask this question, and it may, it may not have happened. Um, like, how has your research changed the way you think about life or uh, anything, really? So I didn't expect to come into an RNA lab when I joined, and so I think... I definitely have an appreciation for how little we know mm. compared to how much we think we know and how much we still have to learn. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second half of your question? <laughs> Just how has that, uh, how has that changed your like, outlook on life, your behavior, um, if, if at all? Uh, not, really. <laughs> not really. Not really. 
Um, but I think one thing I've learned from grad school or science in general is um, like the results of one paper may be supportive of something but not ne necessarily conclusive and your individual genetics even though you know humans share 99.9% .9 of their DNA um, our individual genetics between each other is so different that mm -hmm. what might work for one person could be totally catastrophic to someone else and I think that's what's really um, especially in like healthcare mm -hmm. that's what's really amazing to me and something I'm like really interested in yeah absolutely and link RNAs probably play a huge part of that yeah right? and so I mean we've just been talking generally about link RNAs and we don't know how they function but there are a lot of them and they mm -hmm. seem to play important roles but then they also are tissue specific so mm -hmm. some are mm -hmm. expressed more in the brain some are expressed more in the heart um so why what are they doing there mm -hmm. now I know there's this phenomena in the axons and protein coding regions um, and people always look for these like one base pair changes in the DNA so if you flip one uh, instruction point in the blueprint your protein structure changes that proteins function presumably changes uh, and then that might result in someone having an adverse reaction to a drug for example mm -hmm. or having a higher risk for cancer or Alzheimer's disease whatever it is does that happen in link RNAs uh I have I guess do we know yes it yet? and no <laughs> so because link RNAs don't have a defined structure so far as we know like protein coding genes they are a lot more flexible in mutations and their evolution mm -hmm. so placental mammals have exist but the exist between animals between mammals is very different um, for example in humans it's about 19 kilobases long in mice it's 17 kilobases long um, I believe in cows it's like 30 kilobases long so like you know it varies extremely um, and then in marsupials they have a link RNA that's analogous to exist it shuts down the X chromosome but it's completely different from exist so sorry <laughs> like going no, back going back to identifying that, yeah. protein motifs that interact with RNA that's another reason why we think um, that's a good way to identify functional RNAs um, because a lot of the proteins that interact with exist mm. in mice, which is the cells we study, um, also interact with this link RNA in marsupials. Mm. Wow. So you have, yeah, all of this diversity in just one, like, in just one link RNA, and there could be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Yes. Um, and so, and, yeah, and so back to your original question, um, individual mutations in link RNAs may not have such a catastrophic role sure. as they do in proteins, but then, um, and this isn't necessarily about link RNAs, but in the genome in general, we have um, one person may have uh, an A or an adenine at a specific location, and someone else may have a T or a thymine mm. and that one base pair change can determine whether a link RNA or a protein gene is expressed more or less mm. so just yeah not yeah. even in any genes just in your genome um, variability and so that's what genome-wide association studies or GWAS right. looks at is specific changes in one region from one person to another in the general population how that affects gene expression changes and therefore like the gene dosage um, in some cases i assume um i'm i'm not in exist but i'm sure in other areas of the genome where mm -hmm. a few genes are silenced by a link rna mm -hmm. um if I, for example um enhancer rnas are expressed near enhancers and they can help recruit transcription factors to genes, so then genes are more highly expressed. But if there's a difference in one of the base pairs upstream or like ahead of the enhancer RNA, then maybe the enhancer RNA isn't expressed as highly, and then it can't recruit as many transcription factors to that protein gene, and then that protein gene isn't expressed as much. 
Yeah. I'm gonna send you many <laughs> there, many yeah. visuals. There's all um, these layers. I'm thinking it's like an, an Inception novel it, style it thing. Is. It's a have... black hole of yeah. what's going on. How do you keep this organized? Um, a lot. I literally have a master PowerPoint. Uh, it's called just data. And so <laughs> at almost every paper I've read, I have a PowerPoint with the main figure, like the main summary or mm -hmm. conclusion of the paper, and then. Um, just some parts of the text it's mm -hmm. very helpful because you can organize it like logically or by year and it yeah uh but yeah um reading a lot because there are so many different facets of this mm -hmm. like it's not just one protein that leads to a disease it's tons of rna that interact with who knows how many proteins and we don't know why and that's what we're trying to figure out mm -hmm. yeah and it's i mean it, as it's scary as epigenetics was to me when i first heard about it um this is like tenfold more terrifying in that there are there seem to be more possibilities even than epigenetics and it's it's <laughs> such a new field yeah. too i think it's really exploded over the past maybe five ten years and i'm sure in the next five to ten years the technology technological advances will help us understand everything a lot more mm -hmm. um so we could be making, and this is in general something really interesting or fascinating I find about science is you can make a really general conclusion now and think you know what's happening. And then, you know, in five, ten years, what you found was maybe kind of right, but also not right at the same time. And mm -hmm. you're finding something else that's happening. It's just a constant um, fine-tuning of all the knowledge that we've gained so far. One step at a time. I know, right. It's very incremental. I, it's it's kind of hard to see the bigger picture sometimes as a graduate student, but you multiply one graduate student by thousands, and you know one lab by thousands. You get, you know, we will get there. <laughs> so we opened up this black box um, with link RNAs. I've heard some really kind of astounding claims that they could like potentially be used to inform therapies, like new drugs, for example. Um, for all sorts of diseases. Uh, is that something that you're thinking about in the lab? Or do you just try and like... So while Mara was in the pharmacology department, <laughs> we don't, ter our lab at least mm -hmm. doesn't terribly work with drugs. Mm -hmm. um, so it is definitely possible that link RNAs can be used as biomarkers. Mm -hmm. um, or their expression can be used as biomarkers um, in looking at diseases in the future, especially in a lot of cancers. Cancers are very complex and messy in the first place, but RNA and link RNAs tend to be misregulated or expressed at not normal levels. Um, so that's where maybe we look at RNA for a biomarker. Mm -hmm. RNA can interact with protein, um, RNA can form, it's not just a single line. If you've ever seen a diagram of DNA, it's like two lines together and people tend to think of RNA as just one line, but um, it can create 3D structure, it can fold on itself. Um, and I'm sure that it would be able to interact with different drugs. So maybe if a link RNA is expressed more than it should be, mm -hmm. um, and that's making it interact with other proteins that it shouldn't, maybe a drug can kind of act as a decoy for a protein and so that link RNA is interacting with a drug mm -hmm. rather than a protein um, and dampening the disease effects of a more highly expressed link RNA is a possible mm -hmm. therapeutic avenue in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know much about <laughs> drugs and link <laughs> RNA okay. so. Yeah. yeah I know it's it's just always fun for me to think about like where this is going and 10, 20, 30 years. I and I know this is agree. super new for science in general. Like, link RNAs are this, again, I, I can't help but thinking of dark matter. Like, we didn't discover it that long ago, and we know it's there, but people are just kind of poking it yep. right now. Yep. So it's really exciting. Um, yeah, is there anything else you want to tell us about link RNAs? Otherwise, I'd, I'd love to talk about SWAC with the time we have left. Um, no, I brought up one of my favorite points was that you know, placental mammals have exist, marsupials have this other link RNA that functions the same way, mm -hmm. but it's not like um, conserved at all. It's completely different. Um, and just how they function is really not 
clear and how many there are just the whole mystery is what is really interesting to me yeah. um and i hope that this all these different questions that we really don't know the answer to is intriguing to the listeners and that they may have learned something or want to go check something out yeah i mean genetics are are not my strong point <laughs> genetics is not my strong point i should say um but now i know i need to do a lot more reading so if you can send me any like starter references yes. maybe yep. because uh, i don't think i could understand some of the stuff that you're reading and putting in your powerpoints but um definitely i mean i'm visualizing this because i've seen it a little bit before but visuals here are going to be so important and i'll definitely toss those in yeah there. yep yeah the notes um by the way marsupials are just a crazy group of organisms yep. right <laughs> so they're, they're like half mammals but they also lay eggs yeah is that i mean are there any special things about existing or the analog of existing marsupials that um come along with that or is it just because their lineage is so vastly different i just think it's their lineage is so different and like i said um link rnas don't have that defined structure so mm -hmm. they are um they're able to mutate and or change their composition and it's fine mm -hmm. um so it may not have even been the same genetic code that got passed down. Yeah, um, I think what ha if I remember correctly, they mammals evolved exist and marsupials evolved this link RNA called RSX mm -hmm. independently, but they serve right. the same function, which I think is fascinating. So that's yeah, convergent evolution, which is when two paths end up doing the same thing, two genetic paths, I guess, in this case, do the same thing versus divergent, where you can have one gene and then it mutates and it does two different things yep. later. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is, it's blowing my mind. And yeah, now I have to do some more reading. <laughs> but <laughs> um, of course, if you can send any resources, I do want to plug uh, Science Writing Communication Club. I think it's, I think it's great. It really got me um, starting to think about, you know, what I wanted to do. Um, I posted an article on there. I thought it was going to be in the spring rotation, but I wasn't. I'm not. So maybe uh, fall of next year, I'll definitely be there. Or the summer. We have a summer rotation. Okay. Yeah, I'll sign up for that too. Um, it, anyway, so you can check out uh, the pipettepen.com. Yep. Or, okay. Dot com. Uh, I will definitely link that in the show notes. Um, we have them in our network page as well. And uh, yeah, I mean, you're doing a great job. It's You organize like all of these like, dozens and dozens of grad students per semester. They're all putting out articles that are vetted by other students and it's all factual and you can learn a little bit about um, what a lot of people are, are working about in text form. So if you don't have time to listen to the podcast, I, you know, if you do have time to read, I would highly recommend uh, Pipette Pen. Does Swack do any other uh, blog stuff as well? Um, so we're starting a new blog or rather revitalizing an old blog um called the tibbs career blog it's not so much writing like writing about science papers that come out or science topics um but it's a way for students to explore potential career paths and so anytime a speaker comes to unc which is like multiple times a day um, or someone is interested in a career and they go on an informational interview um we ask that if they're willing they kind of just write up a summary, you know, what are the advantages, disadvantages of this career, what kind of background do you need, what's the growth um, looking like, and so they just write this blog post about this career and then post it to the TIBS web webpage. And right. TIBS for UNC is like a career um, and skill program where graduate yeah. students are able to you know apply for internships um learn about science policy science writing um government and so we want to make this a resource available for other graduate students who either don't have the time or are just starting out to figure out what they want to do is they can read these interviews with different uh career professionals um see what careers after graduate school can look like and so this is a blog that we're just starting thanks too. okay yeah let's check that out um definitely gonna be useful for me as i start doing that myself and hopefully i can contribute <laughs> when i actually get on some of these uh informational interviews 
about the time i need to start thinking yeah about it. yeah <laughs> we had um we actually had a workshop in the beginning of january um where we learned how to write up and how to perform oh. inter, inter oh my goodness informational interviews um and the leader of the workshop said it's never too early to start right and i, I was freaking out i was like maybe i should be doing all of this right now even though i still have like three years left yeah but I mean, at least you're thinking about it at this moment. Yeah, I'm thinking about it. Still haven't done anything about it. It's but... it's hard. You want to do lab work, then you also want to have a job after the lab work. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, you know, I can talk for hours on work life balance and then work life career search balance in grad school, but you're making it easier for us, and I appreciate We're that. We're trying. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really helpful. Mm. Um, anything else about uh, SWAC? Do you have any? Uh, events for people here on the UNC campus or so we do have a few events coming up um, I don't remember the exact dates but okay, I can I mean, send yeah. out a link that you can put um, with the video so we have one where medical writers are going to be coming to campus and talking about mm. what is a medical writer what do they do on a daily basis um, we have a speaker coming from Northwestern, I believe, in April, and she will be giving a talk on how to communicate science empathetically and how to um, connect with someone, you know, on the opposite viewpoint of you. How to just talk to someone and not with a different viewpoint and not just have it get into an argument. Um, so as it often does, yeah. as it often does. Um, and then we have a final event in April where Efra Rivera Serrano will be giving a talk. Um, he's a new research associate professor, I believe, um, in the micro department. And he's also very big on science communication and outreach. Um, he started this page called Unique Scientists, where you know, people from all over the world, all different backgrounds, all different characteristics, tell their story mm -hmm. um and it's more i mean it's very inspiring and it gives younger people who are thinking about science role models they can see this person is like me mm -hmm. i can now see myself more in this kind of position um and so we're really excited for those events yeah that's awesome i think the media does science a disservice a lot of times i it's agree like one or two stereotypes in a white lab coat in a lab that looks like labs I have basically never seen before. When I bring someone to lab um, for the first time, I ask, I always ask them, is this what you expected a lab to look yeah. like? Because we have microwaves, we have like casserole dishes that we use stuff for. It's not, it's not all high tech equipment. Right. Yeah. And like there's, there's one lab on campus that looks like a TV lab. It's really neat. Um, everything's like white and you know, it's very, uh, very organized there's a lot of empty space mm -hmm. any other lab not the case uh, at least in my perception when i yeah i brought my parents here and they were like it's actually a lot more colorful than i imagined like there's color everywhere everything's a different color versus like this monochrome mm -hmm. i don't know that's my gripe with it because <laughs> when i was you know when i was a kid i wasn't that interested in science i thought it would be boring because i'm like i don't want to be in this just like pure white room with glass everywhere and and afraid to touch stuff so anyways that's my rant but <laughs> i do appreciate the science um writing and communication club of course we will link all of this in the show notes um thank you so much rachel is there anything else you want to like let the listeners know um i didn't really ask about your path into science and i always love to ask about that as well uh, so i've always been exposed to science because my dad is a doctor mm. um and i always loved science i majored in genetics in college and had the idea that I was going to become a doctor um, until I started, I joined a research lab and started doing research. And then I realized I much rather spend time, would spend time in the lab than going to classes, I hated studying. Mm -hmm. And so I was, uh, I was thinking med school is not for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I applied to grad school and was fortunate enough, enough to be accepted at UNC. And it's definitely been the best decision that's ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm loving it here and I'm loving everything I'm learning. So my path to science was, I, I've always been interested in it. Um, I just took 
like a right turn from med school to grad school. Mm. Yeah, I found that I liked the hands-on learning. Yep. And it's I, like I much I learn much better when I'm able to do things myself instead of just reading about it. Yeah, absolutely. I had a kind of a similar experience with them, so but vet school though. Yeah. <laughs> to science. I guess just a quick plug for the pipette pen. Um, I know we've been yeah. talking a lot about biological science, mm. but we do have social science, psychological science, mm. and like um, astronomy mm. um, writers that have joined within the past year, which is one nice. thing that the pipette pen is trying to do is branch out just from biological science. Mm -hmm. um, and those articles have, very inter have been very interesting. Nice, I'll have to check them out. I, I know, yeah, the pipette pen, because pipettes are typically used in biological yes. science, but um, yeah, it's become this like huge archive of uh, an immense amount of knowledge, so yes. yeah. Yeah, thanks again, Rachel. Yeah, thanks Appreciate so much it. for having me. Thanks for listening, all.